Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this session of the Spring 2012 SLIS Colloquia uh, Series. Uh, I'm Dr. Bill Fisher, uh, along with my colleague Lori Bell. We're the co-coordinators for the Colloquia Series uh, this spring. Um, Lori sends her uh, regards. She is not feeling very well today, so she won't be able to join us but uh, hopes to be here for the last colloquial session for the spring, which happens uh, about a week or so from now. Um, at this point, it's my um, privilege to introduce our, our speaker today, and it's uh, someone from uh, SLIS, uh, Dr. Anthony Grenier, who I've had the pleasure of working with for, uh, since he's uh, come to San Jose State to join our faculty. Uh, Anthony has uh, received a leadership grant from uh, IMLS, the Institute for Museum and, and Library Studies, uh, the major grant giving organization for libraries in the United States. And he's here uh, to share with us some of what he's gotten from his grant research to date because it's a multi-year uh, project and he'll tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, you can see the title on the um, slide, so I, I won't read that for you because you can all read uh, yourself. Uh, let me just tell you that uh, Anthony, uh, in his uh, PhD work, uh, was uh, dealing with the topic of public spaces and how they're used in the United States. So this is very much uh, along the lines of a topic of interest that he's had for a number of years and has become uh, sort of a recognized authority in this area. So Anthony, it's all yours. I'd like to thank Bill, uh, Dr. Bill Fisher and, and Lori Bell, as well as our uh, technical assistant, Randy Chang, today for producing today's, today's presentation. They are a disruptive force that interrupts the study of serious readers, constantly talking and giggling, always eating in the library, stealing library materials, preening and strutting. They're interested only in trivial things and create chaos in the library. You might recognize this general complaint if you work with or around young people in libraries, but you also might laugh nervously to learn that these observations were actually made in the 19th century by white male librarians complaining about adult white middle class women. Burgeoning numbers of female library users in the late 19th century were accused not only of disrupting uh, established library order, but of threatening the very social fabric of respectable society. Exasperation at these behaviors reached ahead in the 1880s, and in response to these pesky women and their outrageous lack of decorum, public libraries grudgingly segregated space for them, largely to protect the prerogatives, however, of their primary concern, white middle class gentlemen. Thus, libraries gave ladies space of their own where they might talk and giggle and preen and strut and pursue their trivial things. The point here is that our culture gradually accepted women as entitled and active agents in the public world. We know this because we, uh, libraries made space for them. Eventually, as women themselves gained status and authority as professionals, they made space for children. Indeed, libraries, in constant response to changing societal concerns, have adjusted the concept of who counts and what activities matter. Consider the history of racial and linguistic desegregation in libraries. Consider the ways we have increasingly made libraries accessible for the disabled. And even the more recently, uh, the more recent innovations we've made space for computer technology. There are many people in the profession today, for example, who can tell stories of the introduction of public access computer catalogs and how they were abruptly inserted into library space. Often on the very day, card catalogs were just tossed into the trash. That's what I call making space. So we have as a profession constantly changed who counts and what activities matter in libraries. Yet what has remained a rather static spatial aesthetic in libraries over our some 150 year history is the fact that until rather recently, and I mean by that the last 10 or 15 years, 
uh, we have we have only then considered uh, young adults. We've widely viewed them, <clears throat> even though they constitute about 25% of our users, we've devoted more space and design consideration to bathrooms. Since 2009, as a member of the faculty at San Jose State University's School of Library and Information Science, I have received two national leadership grants from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, IMLS, to finally produce our field's first empirical research at the nexus of library space, design, and young people. The first grant supported preparation for the three-year study currently underway. As a scholar and researcher, I, ha uh, I view it as my, one of my key responsibilities to do what practicing librarians cannot do and what they do not have time to do, which is to conduct actual scholarly research to advance our work. In my particular case, this is to advance YA librarianship. After a brief review of the context in which this work fits, I'm going to share some of the results of our two preliminary studies, update you on the progress we've made in our current study, and then show you some of the impacts this work is already having on library spaces and beyond. So to provide some background to why our work here represents an original contribution, I'd like to briefly contextualize where the field's research, uh, the research uh, field's recent literature brings us. Children's Spaces, published in 2005 by architect Mark Dudek, tellingly does not register libraries at all. And this is a theme that I'll pick up toward the end of the presentation. John Bushman and Gloria Leakey edited a properly and highly regarded The Library as Place in 2006. And while there is an excellent sampling of current cultural and historical treatments of spatial meanings here, the work does not mention young adults at all. More commonly, however, the field has produced a growing list of guides published by practitioners and consultants based on their respective experience. Here we have Tish Murphy's Libraries Fur Library Furnishings, a planning guide, which is a very broad treatment of various library environments. Readers will find a three-page chapter on spaces for YAs. What we learn here is that architects, general space planners, and library historians have not seen fit to address young people in what we otherwise like to consider as a radically democratic public venue. A bit closer to home, we are beginning to amass a small body of useful resources. Kim Boland's Teen Spaces has become popular on the way to her experience as a consultant, as has Sandra Feinberg and James Keller's Designing Space for Children and Teens in Libraries and Public Places and Michael Farrelly's more recent Make Room for Teens carries an informative subtitle, Reflections on Developing Teen Spaces in Libraries. For all of the enthusiasm demonstrated in these works, however, we must distinguish between them and the production of valid and generalizable empirical research. Enthusiasm, in other words, can take us only so far and then no further. Thus, we can't yet claim that we've established best practices. Indeed, we have not even identified demonstrable common practices yet. Confusing the differences between opinions rendered by practitioners and consultants on the one hand, and the conduct of supportable claims advanced by systematic data collection and analysis on the other, represents an important and ongoing problem for library and information science. But this issue exceeds the scope of today's presentation. Suffice it to say, though, that while each contribution has its place, of course, it is also clear that many of the important distinguishing features between the two are blurred, and the consequences of this confusion hamper the advance of our professional development. Nevertheless, while the topic of YA space and design continues to be addressed mostly by people with informed opinion, we still have produced a few scholarly treatments. The first actual scholarship on YA space appeared in a 2006 Public Libraries article by UC Berkeley architecture professor Dr. Galen Kranz. Ironically, this was a brief post-occupancy study, which means an examination of a YA space after it had been designed. Uh, the study reported on the reception of the space by the young people who actually used it. We have also seen one master's thesis and one PhD dissertation in recent years. The PhD dissertation was an ethnographic study of one particular space and thus its capacity to generalize beyond that is limited. So while young adults have been around for, oh, 
I don't know, at least a few years in our civilization, as of 2009, we had yet to produce a single generalizable scholarly study of YAs in the nominally free, open, and public space of the library. In addition to this scholarship and in response to this circumstance, I published a small-scale study of the 10 smallest YA spaces that had been previously profiled in the YA uh, librarian's most important magazine, Voice of Youth Advocates, VOYA, and I called it A Space for Myself to Go, Early Patterns in Small YA Spaces. I need to issue a brief disclaimer here because I currently serve on the VOYA board. While there are many things that qualify this study as not widely generalizable, such as the results were only self-reported and the sample size is far too small, 10 small libraries. Some suggestive patterns did, however, appear. We follow up on some of these patterns in later work, and I'll share that in a moment. But before I do, I'd like to review what this first little study suggested. Among the first pattern, uh, patterns that stood out, even in this small sample, is how far we have to go before we can claim that we know what best best practice means. The largest percentage of YA space was executed by the smallest of the library facilities, while the largest library facilities reported allocating the least amount of square footage. So it's an inverse. And what this suggests is that we have uh, yet to even identify any even rough standards for how much or what percentage of a library ought to be devoted to YAs to attain spatial equity. We also asked about the percentage of square footage these libraries devoted to YA space as compared to the total square footage of the entire facility. Of these 10 libraries, what is your guess about the percentage of square footage libraries devoted to YA space? Uh, the answer for these is 2.2%. The only actionable question, however, to raise here, and this is important to, to note, if young people constitute about 25% of library users, is 2.2% reflective of an equitable share of the library space? And I do ask that question honestly because it's an open question. Another question we asked, uh, we asked for the number reporting the use of any kind of design theme in the space that they used and developed. And the answer here is three of 10 of the libraries saying that they used a spatial design theme as a, as a good thing, we asked. Is it a neutral thing? Is it a bad thing? We, we really don't know. We also don't know if young people even care or if they notice if there's a theme in the space. In question four, we asked for the number who, uh, the number reported using youth participation in the planning process. And that was all 10 reported that they did. The most important single dynamic change in YA service philosophy over the past quarter century has been the notion that libraries need to better involve young people in the delivery of service. Um, that all 10 of the small libraries reported a youth participation component in how they en enacted these YA spaces does represent, if nothing else, a high degree of penetration of this idea into practice. Seating options is one of the most important defining features of a YA space. It remains a rich area for exploration. So the question was, what what uh, was the, uh, what number reported relying on standard matching table and, ta and task chair solutions for their YA space seating? And the answer here wasn't so positive. That nine of 10 libraries reported relying on standard table and chair solutions suggests that we have a lot of work to do on this topic. Then we asked the number that reported conducting what architects call a post-occupancy study of the changes they made. And here again, we have some sad results. Zero of the 10 libraries reported following up with their YA users to determine if, how, or to what degree they liked the changes the library made. This is the value of the Galen Cran study I mentioned previously, and it's still the only post-occupancy study ever published on a YA space. This finding, though, like the last one about seating options, suggests that we have a good deal of work ahead of us before we can start talking about best practices. In examining the smallest libraries profiled in VOIA, then, we do not arrive at definitive answers to these questions. Methodologically, as I said, 
The brief study did not afford time to confirm what these self-reported surveys told us, nor is the sample size large enough to generalize so as to inform what we should do in general practice. There are, however, additional questions that arise from these suggestive findings. Uh, and we don't have time to enumerate the many unanswered questions this, that this study raised, but we can, for instance, note that when 9 out of 10 libraries say that they involve young people in the design process, we really don't even know what that means. How, for example, did libraries involve young people in the design process? What would successful participation mean? And would that, what would successful partici participation mean for the young people or for libraries or even for the architects involved? The IMLS project research team and I are uh, trying to address some of these issues right now, among others, and then even um, uh, incorporate them into our larger study. The second study I can share with you today comes from a more comprehensive treatment of all of the nearly 80 libraries that have been published, uh, have published YA-based profiles in VOIA since the column, the regular column, began in 1999. So it's not just the 10 smallest. For this study uh, that I will publish shortly in a book I'm editing entitled Voya's YA Spaces of Your Dreams Collection, we have reported, uh, we have reproduced all of the profiles in one place and then followed up by conducting a survey of them all. While not all of the libraries participated, we did see some important patterns emerge from the 35 libraries that did. What is clear from these data and what ought not shock anyone in this audience is that those institutions pursuing broader space equity for YAs experienced a variety of demonstrable service outcome enhancements, and YA staffs uh, felt that they were more supported institutionally than they had prior to offering a YA space. On the other hand, and contrary to our own prevailing legacy practices, values, and prerogatives, librarians also reported that YAs emphasize and value their own experience and meanings of these public spaces over the library's traditional commitment to collections and materials. So what we found was that YA services improved, the staff felt supported, uh, better supported in providing them, though what constituted better YA service was not what we fantasized about providing. Well, what does that really mean? We asked each of the 80 libraries that had proudly written and published profiles of their new or renovated spaces for young people between 1999 and 2010 only six questions. The first one was a freebie, library's name. Question two, among the 35 libraries responding to the most popular feature question, why a spatial identity received the largest support with 24 responses? Librarians told us that the second most important popular feature was YA social experience, which received 23 responses. Significantly, the more, predictable, uh, the more predictably conventional features of technology and collection were not identified as the most popular from the librarian's point of view, receiving 19 and 15 responses respectively. Not even half of the librarians responding felt that the collections were close to the most important feature. While collections increasingly demonstrate a lower importance when compared to separate space identity and social experience, the highest number of responders, 26, reported that the collection usage increased after opening their YA space. Use of technology was reported to have increased by 20 of the respondents, and seating capacity was reported to have increased by 13. Question three also generated significant positive narratives uh, in their response from several libraries. Um, here, librarians identified comments such as, programming continues to increase. Another said, outgrown space, a new one is planned for 2012. Yet another, expanded space, doubled our room size, and we finally had a great teen sign above the door of the teen room. One librarian reported that usage, access, outreach, and involvement all increased over the past few years. So if you're looking for one takeaway from what evidence we have thus far, it is the introduction of a YA space demonstrates a wide array of positive service outcomes. It's taken us until 2012 to prove this? Well, actually, yes. Question four, 
Fully 21 of the 35 libraries reported either an increase in staff hours or no change. And this is certainly important for uh, an audience of library school students. This must be noted as a tremendous advance in broadening of institutional commitment in support of professional young adult specialization, particularly during a time of economic stress. While it is true that seven libraries reported a decrease or diminished support for YA professional staff training since the introduction of Hawaii Space, it is also true that 27 of the 35 reported an improved or unchanged condition. Again, this result must be viewed against the current backdrop of severe economic challenges to libraries in general, as well as other coincidental positive patterns of, in the successful defense of existing and even increased staff development. An even more positive pattern took shape in the matter of YA involvement in YA activity. YA volunteerism and advisory group participation, participation show particular promise. Of the 35 libraries responding to the survey, 18 reported increased YA volunteerism. Another finding enhanced the previous three and represents perhaps a, the survey's most valuable learning for the profession as a whole. Of the 35 libraries responding, a full 33 reported that the organizational perceptions of YA users either improved or was unchanged. So once again, contrary to many institutional assumptions, the more libraries were exposed to young people enjoying improved spatial equity, the more libraries viewed youth in a positive light and the less they regarded youth as liabilities. Because apprehension toward increased numbers of youth in the library remains a common concern of library staff, this finding suggests a potential culture change across the profession. Question four elicited more narrative detail than any of the other survey questions. All of the added comments reported on positive gains either in service or resources after instituting a YA space. One library commented, for instance, CERC of YA materials has gone up 40 to 80 percent. Hired two YAS prepare professionals. That's the same, that's the same quote. Another stated, book budget doubled, space doubled. Still others reported half-time teen librarian with MLIS. Um, with, a, with a master's degree on staff now. We have added YA programming and now have a teen library volunteers. And I have been hyper vigilant in hiring new staff who value the importance of serving the needs of teens. These questions obviously attempt to follow up on the earlier study, which we asked the 10 smallest libraries about the square footage relative to the total square footage of their YA spaces. What we found was even worse than the previous figure. What well, you might recall uh, that the 10 smallest white spaces average only 2.2 percent of their facilities total square footage. The average percent of white space reported by the 35 libraries completing this survey less than 2 percent. And it must be noted here that these libraries are, were justifiably proud enough of the acquisition of their white space that they published their profiles in our national magazine. For all of the suggestive findings that we have from these brief explorations into YA space, the research we are currently conducting, also funded by an IMLS National Leadership Grant, promised to be much more substantial and capable of supporting much broader findings and generalizations. Our current three-year project includes three parts. We are coming at the idea of YA spaces from various points of view, from a variety of methodological approaches, and we build upon and will build upon questions we could not previously ask as well as some refinements of ones that we have already asked. But the core question for each of these three parts is chasing it's, is the same simple question. What is the current state of practice in designing library spaces for young adults? First, we're surveys, we are surveying nearly 800 libraries across the country. Every library profiled in the last five years of Library Journal's annual architecture issue. Each year, that issue identifies every new and substantially renovated library in the nation. We're using the LJ list to survey these 800 libraries to determine how they are currently defining and enacting YA spaces. We're asking questions, for example, such as, how was the YA space funded? If the YA space resulted in 
from library renovation, what existing area or areas changed to create it, which scenario best connects youth participation, who was the primary agent to advocate for the YA space, what were the three biggest challenges, and how did you overcome them? Also part of this data collection effort, we are working with one of our grant partners, San Francisco's Center for Juvenile and Criminal Justice, to survey young people in these same 800 libraries and get their views on what new libraries, on what their new libraries have achieved. So we're asking young people, for example, questions such as, does this library, YA uh, or teen section, have comfortable places to sit and hang out? Do you find that you came, uh, do you find what you came for in the YA section most of the time? What are the best parts of the YA section? And this is one you'll like. Should eating be allowed in the library? I have used a quote uh, for today's presentation title from one of the responses from that, from that survey. Everything I need and want is in the teen section. A second phase of the IMLS research project features live video footage taken from 25 subject libraries that participated in our original big survey. The video footage and the narration that goes with it will be recorded both by librarians as well as by young people themselves. Our team will then recreate those spaces in the virtual environment called Second Life. Once we've reconstructed these spaces virtually, we'll invite librarians, young people, architects, administrators, LIS students, and other interested parties from all over the world to take tours in our YA space laboratory and complete brief surveys of their impressions. Pictured here are Baseball Babenko, starring me, and Jeannie Blazewood, starring as research assistant Julie Whitehead. Finally, the third phase of our study will use that same footage, but this time we'll conduct an in-depth ethnographic analysis of the narrative comments rendered by both librarians and the young people who record them in their respective spaces. What did librarians say about their spaces? What did young people say? Taken together, not only will this research yield substantial and generalizable learning on what currently is going on in libraries as they reach for spatial equity for young people, but it will also become the largest single gathering of YA service data in at least the past decade. Swiss so graduate students, professional library practitioners, architect and design professionals, among others, can look forward to seeing the dissemination of our learning from this project, both in peer-reviewed scholarly journals, as well as in a variety of our practitioner magazines, as well as in other locations. We are preparing to mount the raw data into the project's youthfacts.org website so that future researchers and students can go in, transparently mine the rich data, and test to see what we might have missed in our own analysis. Any serious study must answer this important question if it expects to make a meaningful contribution. So, so what? How will this work matter to libraries, to young people, or even to anyone? So before I end today's presentation, I'd like to share some of the more tangible impacts this work in combining youth, design professionals, and libraries, and see what's, um, uh, give you a sense of what it's starting, how it's starting to already have uh, impact on real and actual places. Most of the time, library projects yield involvement that is little more than what we architects, uh, that what architects refer to as obtaining basic client building program information. In other words, architects extract what should go on in a building or space. That's called the program information. And then they go on to design whatever they're going to design anyway. Currently, under the best circumstances, for YA design in particular, libraries work with architects and include some young people at some point. But I call this, I call this a triangle of incompetence. Because in the real world, architects typically don't know very much about libraries and even know less about young people. Libraries, on the other hand, do not tend to know very much about architecture and little about how young people enact space on their own. And young people, for their part, don't know very much about architecture and very little, really, about libraries. 
So we put all of these people together, again, under the best circumstance, and somehow we expect that we're going to get some amazing, successful spatial outcomes. I'm not saying this because I'm trying to blame anyone. It's nobody's fault in particular, but the outcome is actually quite predictable. How, for instance, we call this a space for young people is really well beyond my capacity to understand, and yet this is currently regarded as one of the nation's signature YA spaces. So what our project is trying to do is probe what is necessary to address this endemic triangle of incompetence and work more effectively with the involved parties. This is the Oakland Public Library's teen zone in California. The main library facility uh, totals 87,000 square feet in all. The teen zone measures 3,000 square feet, which represents about uh, 4.6 of the library's total square footage. And that, as you can r recall from our earlier discussion, is sometimes three, maybe four times larger than most libraries that we have surveyed so far. Here's another angle on the library teen zone. You can see lots of different kind of aesthetic principles, especially compared to that first one I showed you. These are things that are that are arrived at with uh, young people who are partners in the project. This is the original 1964 PG&E building in downtown Berkeley. Um, it was given not too long ago from PG&E as a gift to the Berkeley YMCA. And the Berkeley YMCA did a very radical thing, actually. And uh, imagine this, this uh, building turned over to the young people in the community as the YMCA Teen Center. And as a consequence of that thinking, they went all the way further, uh, they went all the way through that concept and brought young people very much into the every step of the design process, from the selection of the architecture firm, which I uh, consulted to, and actually my, my, my hat is peeking out over here on the left, um, from the beginning of the selection of the architecture firm that could work on the project, all the way through every construction phase. Young people were involved in the conversation, they were involved with the professionals involved, and they were involved with the staff. And it was an amazing project uh, where, where young people even visited the architecture, architect's office, and we went through lots of different design conversations. This is the outcome of that process. Um, it was recently uh, referred to in the Berkeley Press as one of the most striking buildings in recent uh, Berkeley architectural history. Um, and it's really the same bones of the building. The, the uh, YMCA did not have the money to redesign the building, so we used the bones and the structure of the building, but, but entirely changed its interior, uh, gutted it entirely, started all over, and used what we could of the outside. The exterior here is very much contrasted to a bland concrete block. And the profile of this building on the street now is quite dramatic. One of the innovations that the young people insisted on was some access on the upper floors to creating an entirely uh, a new upper floor that contained a garden spot. And so this area now exists all around the top of the building, and it, it provides views not only of the, uh, the the East Bay Hills, but also of the San Francisco Bay. But uh, it was part of how the, the design conversation happened, and young people just, even though it cost more money and it took more time to raise it, they wanted a, a garden spot and they wanted it to be able to be accessible to the outside. Another design feature was that they, they want to continue to promote um, uh, physical activity and how you sometimes promotes physical activity in the building is to promote using the stairs rather than an elevator. And so rather than having an ugly staircase, they um, co contracted for a, a brilliant, bright, three-story interior uh, mural like this that is um, that, that contains a narrative internally that you can see as you walk up the stairs, but it also dramatically increases the quality of pedestrian experience that you have on the outside of the building. And at night, when that mural is lit up, it has a very striking impression on the street. So these were two of some of the innovations that were introduced and insisted upon by the young people that were very much a part of that entire design process from the beginning all the way to the end. They selected the carpet cover, uh, carpeting, all of the seating, all of the furniture, 
they were there laying um, some of the uh, some of the tiles even learning to do some of that in, as part of the process. In conclusion, I'd like to take just a moment to recognize the other members of our IMLS project team. I've been very privileged to have found six highly skilled and motivated SLIS graduate research assistants to help develop and execute this progress. Um, uh, two have graduated already, but the four current project RAs are Joy Rodriguez, who is, is our uh, project director, Colin Rickman, who is the survey analyst and is doing video acquisition, Julie Whitehead is reconstructing physical YA spaces in virtual space, and Jonathan Bell working on the ethnographic analysis and video data. It has also been my pleasure to work with such expert and dedicated colleagues as Dr. Mike Mills supervising the quantitative data gathering and analysis, uh, Dr. Jeremy Kemp from our own SLIS program supervising the Second Life Space Laboratory, and Dr. Denise Augusto from Drexel supervising ethnographic data gathering and analysis. Finally, we have already begun uh, disseminating our progress at professional conferences. We appeared at last November's California Library Association with two of our project partners, the Open Public Library and the architecture firm of Nolan Tam from Berkeley. The project's graduate research assistants are planning two uh, presentations of their own. One is at this year's coming CLA conference, and the second is at SLIS's Web 2.012 conference. We are already planning a panel proposal for the 2013 annual American Library Association conference. That panel will include other project partners, Group 4 Architecture, Design, and Research from South San Francisco, and the Project for Public Space in New York. It has always been my desire to see the issue connecting youth and space grow beyond our current project with libraries. I've been cultivating this notion for over a decade, and we are now starting to make progress on that agenda. As our data increasingly promises to promote original and demonstrable insights, our recent conversations with project partners has begun to generate rich and exciting conversations about taking our work to audiences of urban designers, architects, and planning professionals, and on issues of public spatiality and youth far beyond libraries. And to the extent that this happens, as we begin to engage issues of public space equity for young people across broader domains of urban design and planning and architecture and the built environment in general, it suggests that libraries will not only be following these disciplinary interventions, but actually leading them. So that's where we are right now. I hope this bird's eye view um, of what this three-year IMLS leadership grant has uh, achieved to date has been interesting. Please continue to keep tabs on us in the literature and at conferences and shortly on the youthfacts.org website. And I should say also that despite what you may have heard about white middle-class women and their antisocial library behaviors destroying Western civilization, I hope you don't ever confuse those accusations with youth behaviors because the data would just be not there, not be there to back you up. So that is the prepared presentation that I have for you today. I also um, would like to open up the questions at this point. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, great presentation, very informative. Uh, as Anthony has indicated, we've got, um, you know, as much as 20 minutes or so for questions if anybody uh, has a question you want to, uh, you know, use, uh, raise your hand and then we'll uh, let you uh, use the microphone to ask your question. You said you were doing, um, you're currently doing a survey of 800 libraries. Is that library systems or is that individual branches? The uh, Library Journal Architectural Issue uh, annually um, reviews quantitatively all of the new buildings. So it's not a system that we're talking about here. These are 800 new library buildings that were either either brand new or dramatically renovated from across the country. Now that doesn't mean we're going to get, in fact, we're not going to get 800 responses, but we are surveying them all. We're asking them all to contribute to the uh, knowledge building here. Um, at this point, we have almost 400. So we've had a very good response, we feel, both from uh, libraries and from young people. But it was um, not library branches necessarily, although if it was a building that was new, that was included. But they're not, uh, it's not a system. One of the things that I, I do get approached about quite a bit is um, 
are very specific questions about what, what solutions are good for a particular library. And because we are just now developing anything close to um, some systematic gathering of common patterns, there really are no hard and fast answers, um, no matter what the question really. So the, the answer to the question, what can we do to fix or what can we do to uh, enact a, a particular space, um, so that's, that's the negative side. We don't really know yet. But the positive side of that is that because we really don't know yet, we haven't established common practices. We haven't established or identified or evaluated best practices. We get to practice and play to our, our imagination's extent at this point. Nothing is going to go too far wrong. Nothing is going to be dem demonstrably too far right at this point. And so I, I know that that's not always a satisfying answer. But because there are no hard and fast rules, um, anything you do at this point is going to be an improvement. And uh, the better, the better uh, practice is to document what you have first, make the change, and then, and then um, evaluate it later, of course. But we don't really have any, any um, top ten best things to do in a YA space. I mean, I have my opinions, and con other consultants and so forth, they may have their opinions, but they're not rooted in anything other than the opinions and our experiences. Um, and so I, I would suggest that at this point, those questions can be answered simply by saying, um, experiment. Just try it and see what happens. I, would, I told the team that I, would, I was going to introduce this, this, uh, mo this, this next comment in the presentation, and I didn't. So I, I have to apologize for that. But um, I, I did want to spend just a moment talking about our experience with the Institutional Review Board, the IRB. Any time that you are a, a researcher and you're going out and you're going to be working with, with people, either in an interview process or something, a survey or, or something like that, you need to be able to develop your research uh, project protocol, and then it goes to the Institutional Review Board on your, on your university's campus for review, and the review is designed to ensure that no harm will come to the subjects involved in the study, no harm. Um, and so in the two phases that we have already uh, used here, a phase for the, the uh, survey of the 800 libraries and then a, another protocol that we've had to develop for collecting the video footage, uh, we had to go to the IRB two times. And um, I would like to, to suggest here that uh, part of our experience has not been a very positive one in that regard in the sense that um, we were asking young people to fill out a, an anonymous online survey in their library under the professional librarian's supervision, and um, the institutional re review board, uh, who is uh, required to pass our protocol before we can proceed with it, um, are oftentimes jammed up by issues involving young people. Um, for example, they treat all people under 18 as children and are and the standards by which they evaluate the protocol proposal are the same. So they are evaluating a, an online anonymous uh, survey administered in a library uh, for a, a 17 or 18 year old, the same as they would evaluate something being involved involving you know small children of three or four, which I think is quite you know comp um, ironic. Uh, another another dimension here is that um, the institutional review board is given authority on a, on an individual campus by its uh, academic senate or its academic community, um, and the academic community determines the degree of care that the IRB needs to exercise in evaluating the protocol proposals. And I feel, in our experience anyway, that that the IRB review that we received, especially in the survey part. Um, didn't exercise the discretion that our academic senate gave us, so uh, gave the IRB, and so we were being asked to uh, adjust or change our our approach, change our uh, subject study, uh, the the subjects that we wanted to survey, and a variety of other things, based upon concepts that really didn't have much to do with libraries or serving young people in libraries, and it delayed 
uh, our, our experience with them has been has delayed our project a couple of times. So there are some problems as researchers, and this is part of why I'm, I'm mentioning this, because as part of the school's experience in grow, with growing uh, research community, we have to continually involve ourselves with the Institutional Review Board, and we have to prepare our protocols so that it will pass their inspection, and sometimes it's not a very smooth situation. We, we were obviously able to successfully get our proposal protocol passed, but it um, it was it was not fun. So there's that. Um, now let me stop again and see if there are any other concepts that that you'd like to talk about or share or any questions you may want. Well, Anthony, I'm going to jump in here and and follow up on your um, last comment about the IRB protocol. Um, and um, sort of guess that that may be one reason why we don't have a lot of uh, good empirical data dealing with with teens because um, I would suspect your experience at San Jose State isn't that different that other people who might have had an interest in this area would have gotten at other places and in some cases it would have been even worse and they just give up and don't get the permission to do the kind of research that we need to have to be able to make these generalizable uh, kinds of findings and so it's good that you've persevered and, and taken it to that level. Well, thanks, Bill, uh, and that's a very perceptive comment. Um, youth services in general is among the more poorly researched uh, subfields in library and information science, and certainly the IRB screen process is contributes uh, mightily to well, at least one factor. Um, it's not the only factor. I don't think it lets us entirely off the hook for a legacy of, of very little research production, but yeah, it does matter and it, it does in fact uh, play a, a very significant and I think in many cases a, um, a delaying, de deflecting, if not discouraging role because it takes these uh, this concept of protecting protection far, far too uh, uh, much, ser too seriously without exercising the discretion, at least according to my reading, in our circumstance that was uh, afforded the IRB at San Jose State by the Academic Senate. Um, it's not the only reason of, for delays, but certainly that, that's one of them. Um, so that's a, yeah, that's an issue. I want to suggest too that the relationship, this triangle of incompetence I've talked about, um, it's not uncommon for architects to come into a project make a presentation, be hired, and then pretty much go off on their own to do the design work. Um, and I do think that the things that we're discovering about young adult spaces and the involvement of young people in them and the, the dramatic changes and, and um, differences that we see in the outcomes are not limited to working with the end user, in this case young adults, it are not limited to the end user problems that architects oftentimes do not overcome. But also some of that responsibility, I believe, resides in libraries. We have been building libraries for 150 years, and yet um, we seem to either feel no responsibility or for whatever reason have not developed the capacity to much more carefully direct the processes that we engage and pay pretty good money for when we engage professional architects and designers. The two partners that we're working with in this project uh, Nolan Tam Architects of Berkeley and um, the Group 4 Architecture Design and Planning in South San Francisco are, are firms that I have worked with and selected, selectively become involved with over time because these are two firms that are very much dedicated to working closely with their clients, but not all are. And um, both of these two firms also have a very strong commitment to public buildings and to libraries in particular. Uh, and again, not all are. <clears throat> but this um, this co this uh, this triangle really does need to be strengthened much more. And I think, um, as students coming through the program, I think it behooves you at least to be aware that at some point in your career, likely you will be involved in a design or at least a new building project. And um, I would just encourage you to be considering now the kind of resources that you would need to bring together, whether they be experiential, outside contracting of con consultants. Um, involving um, other people involved, doing some homework yourself, to be able to much more closely guide and uh, sort of uh, manage the way 
in which architects interact with the end users as well as the staff. Uh, any more comments on that? Well, uh, let me jump in here, Anthony, because this is too good of a segue to, to pass up and give a little promotion for the last of the general uh, colloquia presentations uh, for the spring, which will be the 20th of April. And we have a couple of uh, people from a local, local beams in San Jose design firm that work with uh, architects and libraries in designing new buildings and new spaces. So uh, for those of you that are with us today, uh, you might want to come back and join that session on the 20th of April. And uh, hopefully you've taken some notes, or by then uh, the, the um, uh, recording will be available. And, and uh, you know, remind yourself of, of what Anthony has mentioned today and then see what these people begin to talk about and then um, challenge some of what they uh, may well be presenting. Um, and I have no idea what they're going to present, so it may dovetail very nicely with what uh, has gone on today. But uh, I think the smart money would be that it's probably not going to dovetail that well. Well, thanks, Bill. That's a that's another good point. Um, I am actually hoping to attend that uh, session as well, and I'm going to be listening to see how people, uh, how these these uh, architects um, represent how they interact with the end users, and um, in this case, also library staff. Um, I did want to say, perhaps even in closing, that the work that has been building and that's a contained in this IMLS grant does have implications beyond libraries. And that's actually ultimately where I would like to be able to go. Um, my analysis and my study of how the culture deals with young people is um, characterized in, in ways that I find quite pejorative. And I refer to them that way. I have special terms that I've used. <laughs> Um, and it's not just in libraries. Library, the fact that libraries have, have rather ignored young people and spent, as I said at the beginning, more design space and energy on bathrooms than serving 25% of the, of the, the uh, service population is not to blame libraries. It's to note that that's what libraries have done historically and continue in most cases to do. But it's true of all of our public institutions. Um, public schools, when they're designed, although we don't build too many of those things anymore, but when we do, we typically ignore young people entirely. Um, it's not, and those are not the only places. Uh, public squares, public spaces, sidewalks, and, and a variety of other places are also locations where young people are, if not ignored, actively rejected. And so the involvement of the Project for People, uh, for the Project for Public Space in New York, uh, the conversations that we've been having with them and our own architecture and design firms as part of the project um, is starting to reveal some of these questions. And they are very excited to start uh, incorporating some of this data and analysis into other areas, other public spaces that, uh, that also could better involve young people. And I think that's going to be a contribution that libraries ultimately will be credited for making that, in, in that innovation and that um, intervention. And I'm, I'm going to be very proud when that happens, because that will really put the library in a very different light in terms of the design community. Uh, Dina's comment that retail outlets spend billions to attract young people, well, they do into their individual commercial environments. But we're talking about public spaces. Um, and also, once uh, young people do not have money to spend in a commercial environment, we see how fast those, uh, that dynamic changes. I have a question on long-term study. After the initial research and that comes out, is there any plan to look at, you know, after a really good YA space has been um, surveyed, what happens 10 years down the line when it's a totally different batch of kids coming to the library, potentially a different um, staff member interacting with them? And what's the impact of the space when the, the other factors are changing? Yes, Stacy. thank you for that. Um, the follow-up studies uh, that librarians should conduct, not architects necessarily, uh, but the ones that we should know as part of our ordinary, ongoing evaluation of the service that we provide, I think should include a post-occupancy study, not just the one immediately after 
or redesigned or a new space is introduced, but periodically, every five years or so, as part of a, a, a Hawaii services or a youth services department's ongoing evaluation of all of its services, considering space and how young people feel in there as one of them. The same thing that we should be doing for outreach programming and other kind of programming and the collection development and all of those things. However, uh, to be uh, more realistic about it, uh, we haven't developed much of a capacity in young adult services in particular, but even in library science in general, about doing that kind of thing. And that's why I think that Dr. Galen Kranz's uh, post-occupancy study that was published in uh, public libraries um, is a landmark study for that reason. It kind of gives you a, it kind of raises the bar. Here's an example. Um, I don't have any particular plans at the time, at the, at the moment. We are very busy. We're sort of halfway through our current IMLS grant now in collecting just basic data on what new and renovated buildings have done. Um, but that may, that may certainly be something down the line. Certainly something for perhaps an enterprising PhD student, Stacy. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, very nicely done in, in the commentary and questions afterwards. Uh, thanks again to Randy Chang for technical assistance. And of course, thanks to everybody who uh, participated. Uh, if we have some people with us today who are also working on their portfolios, uh, why are you wasting your, oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> good luck with uh, uh, finishing things up over the next week, and I hope that's a successful process for you. And again, thanks everybody for coming today.